Hi everyone. This is the first official lesson for HOSA Behavioral Health 2024-2025. We'll be taking a look at some basic definitions of psychology and other terminology, the early psychological approaches, and the early psychological perspectives. First off, what is psychology? So here are some few terms that we'll need to understand. First, psychology can be thought of as the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. In other words, it's the scientific study of the mind. But what is the mind itself? Here's a basic definition that will work for our purposes. It's the brain and its activities, including thought, emotions, and behavior. To define the mind is actually a rather philosophical question, and this is generally an oversimplification, but it can be used. For introspection, this is a term that comes a lot in early psychology. It's the personal observation of our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. It's a tool that some early psychologists use to run experiments during which they would ask patient and participants to think about what they're thinking. So they're thinking and thinking about themselves thinking simultaneously. Unfortunately, that's very challenging for most humans. It's actually impossible to think about two things at the same time. So the approach was rather ineffective. We'll get to that soon. Now here are some of the origins of psychology. So we had ancient physicians who claimed that the brain is the source of the mind. And not a lot of people disputed that so immediately. We also had these ancient Greek philosophers who very uh, who believed that there are needed to be a natural explanation for all the observations that we have of the mind, right? There would be people who thought that it was spiritual, uh, supernatural phenomena that caused all this human behavior. They said, no, there's a natural explanation for it. And these natural explanations, they come in two forms. This was an early debate between ancient Greek philosophers that was nearly perfectly evenly split between monism and dualism. Monism is the concept that the mind and body is one, and that the mind is a result of activity in the brain. That's really, that's really an important statement because that was their entire view about the mind. So this was backed by people like Democritus and Aristotle. And as for dualism, uh, mind and body are quite different and they're separate entities. So this was backed up by people like Pythagoras, Socrates, and Plato. This also carried on into later times due to later classicism in Greece and Rome. Uh, so dualism do dominated the Renaissance. And as we'll see in the next slide, Rene Descartes, uh, he was quite a vocal proponent of dualism. What he believed specifically was that the body was mechanical while the mind is a non-physical entity, right? That's, that's old dualism. He thought that because the mind was non-tangible, then you can't observe it. If you can't observe it, you can't study it. If you can't study it, then it's bad for science. You shouldn't do it anyways. And he also believed, yet, that the mind and the body influenced one another. Eventually, scientists uh, in the present day we tend to uh, talk about monism more often, right? That statement that the mind is the result of activity in the brain. And we also combine that with his third point, which is the fact that the mind and the body are always working with each other and interacting. Next up, we have empiricism. So, 17th century philosophers who started with Aristotle, they thought that knowledge came from sensory experience. This is where the metaphor of a blank slate often um, gets mentioned. So essentially the mind starts as a blank slate at birth. 
and as we're filled with knowledge, as we're as we observe the world around us, we are filled with knowledge. And this was popularized by a psychologist called John Locke, who wrote an essay concerning human understanding, which uh, backed up empiricism very significantly and talked about it in great detail. We'll have some uh, quick discussion that will help you understand what I'm going to talk about next. So by the 20th century, behaviorists and these uh, psychologists, they focused on empiricism. So what they were doing was they were essentially observing behaviors which were influenced by experience. And then came the debate about nature versus nurture. So nature was added later, right? They were, so psychologists, they were debating between the influence of inborn traits or versus experience in shaping behaviors. This is where psychology and philosophy are just different. Philosophy, uh, which spent a lot of time dealing with how to define the mind. Well, what do psychologists do? They have to study that mind objectively using the scientific method. They often study the same questions with different approaches. Psychology split from philosophy because of those scientific methods and now because of that a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about next that was when it really started to look like psychology was becoming a science. First we have Gustav Fechner his experiment was based on sound. He wanted to know 50, if I, for example, if I clap really quietly and then I clap more and more loudly, to what extent do I have to clap such that 50% of people would be able to say, I hear you clapping. And that's called the absolute threshold. And Eventually, this is adopted uh, to all the other sensory experiences, including touch, taste, smell, right? So uh, we, we also have this classic example, which is how much uh, difference in sugar do you need to put such that you can distinguish between coffee with eight sugars and coffee with nine sugars. Next, we have a scientist called Hermann von Helmholtz. He was more interested in reaction time and what he was actually studying is the speed of nerve signaling which wasn't entirely uh, able to put it into those terms yet at the time but uh, that's what he discovered and that was actually an important paradigm shift so the experiment was that participants pushed a button immediately after they felt a touch so if you touch a person's thigh they'll react faster than if you touch their toe why is that well, if you think about it, the thigh is closer to the brain, right, than the toe. So the signals from the toe have to travel for a longer distance, and hence a longer time through the nerves. So why is this a par paradigm shift? Because now we've proven that the mind has a physical basis. Behavior is not instantaneous, right? You can't think of the mind and the body as completely separate anymore. And so now, after we uh, finish discussing all those early experiments, we can talk about early approaches in general. So this was um, an increasing trend in psycho well, an increasing uh, number of psychologists had their own uh, differing views about how to best study the mind and the brain. So, uh, and uh, these are a list of those perspective. Uh, perspectives. So first we have structuralism. The concept is that you break down the mind into its smallest elements by doing experiments. And what you want to find out is once I break down the mind into these small pieces of uh, mental experience, I'll be able to understand the mind, hopefully. At least that's what the structuralists believed in. The most important pioneers of structuralism are Wilhelm Wundt and Edward Titchener. Wundt is credited as 
the first experimental psychologist, right? He was one of the pioneers of modern day psychology, where it was a sci where it was a science that differed from philosophy. He built the first experimental research psych lab in Germany in 1879, and he had a student called Edward Titchener. Titchener was actually the one who put structuralism in terms, and then he brought that theory to America by giving many lectures and popularizing um, the approach at Cornell University. And this is where we talk about introspection. Now, structuralism is the um, approach where they use introspection to do experiments. I'll, so for example, I'll ask a person a question, right? Uh, it, it doesn't matter what the question is. It could be a math question, it could be a question about to test their memory. And what their experimenters would do is they would ask the people to share their thought processes while they were thinking in real time. That's not possible because you, you can't focus on two things at once. You can't think about the problem while also focusing about how you're thinking about the problem. And because of that, there was a negative response to structuralism soon afterwards. And between that, let's talk about another approach called Gestalt psychology. So under Gestalt, what that means is the form or the whole. And it's an approach that saw perception as an experience that was greater than the sum of its parts. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's what you need to remember if you can understand Gestalt psychology and its basics. That's how you remember that phrase. What it means is, for example, you're watching this YouTube video right now. You're seeing all the letters on the screen and you're seeing my face and you're hearing my voice. That doesn't mean too much to you as separate things. And as a collective, you don't just add those things up as separate entities. It actually means something to you because you're taking uh, quite a bit of stuff away from it. Now, that's a more broad example. Right, originally, uh, the pioneers like uh, Max Wertemeyer and Wolfgang Kohler, Kohler uh, they were uh, talking more about uh, human sight. So stuff like op optical illusions and uh, alterations to trick the brain, those mind games, that's part of just all psychology, which is uh, basically the question of how can we alter the human perception of these images so that they see things which aren't necessarily true right and that's important for perception and that also goes into the idea of the information processing unit which is a perspective which is a part of a perspective rather than an approach that we'll get to later it effectively deals with how we perceive things in general so it doesn't have to be just with sight right my example before i was talking about sound and the content of the text, right? Just uh, letters, like the actual content of the text, that is something fruitful to your mind. You can also give the example of music. For example, when you're listening to a song, you're not just hearing the individual instruments, uh, let alone the individual notes that the instruments are making. You like what you hear. You like what you hear because you like the collective sound, not the individual tracks. So that would be another pretty uh, good example of just thought psychology in terms of sound. And next we have functionalism, which is the ultimate response to structuralism and in the criticism of introspection. The concept is that they believe behavior is purposeful. Whichever behavior humans end up having, we must have done it for a reason, whether intentionally or consciously or not, right? So it's interested in studying why we do things and how those things work in our mind. The classic example is that it seems so peculiar how humans dream, but because we still do after so many years of evolution, then it must be important for survival. 
that's also a part that's uh, honed on in the evolutionary perspective, not approach perspective. But we'll get to that uh, in the next topic. So people included uh, was primarily William James. He wrote an important book. Right? So while Wilhelm Wundt brought psychology uh, as a research as a physical experiments, uh, Wilhelm James uh, brought psychology to literature by writing the principles of psychology in 1890. Uh, interestingly, he actually created his own lab four years prior to Wundt, but his lab was just for demonstrations at university uh, lectures, not for research and experiments and his functionalism because it was more slightly more sound it dominated the field for 50 years now Will, uh, william james in his book he had this idea of stream of a stream of consciousness he couldn't really uh put in clear words he couldn't really flesh out what he meant by it but essentially it's uh, when humans are thinking of an idea, what mental processes do they go through, right? So if we're trying to solve a problem, what mental processes do we go through in general to solve that problem? What's our thinking process? Right? That's what the stream of consciousness is. And as I've mentioned before, functionalism was heavily inspired by evolution, right? By uh, literature like The Origin of Species and The Descent of Man, by Charles Darwin. Yeah, so the purpose is that actions are necessary for human survival. It studied also the mind as one unit, right? This is uh, quite clear that they were opposing structuralism in every way, in from every single perspective, and they also rejected introspection. Next, we have behaviorism. This is uh, the concept of studying and measuring observable behaviors. We have important psychologists who all contributed to this approach in their own ways, with their own very classic, famous exper experiments. We got Ivan Pavlov, which is how we get the terms Pavlovian conditioning. We got John B. Watson, uh, who uh, adapted the empiricist approach. We also have Edward Thorndike, who pioneered the law of effect. And we also have the F. Skinner, who did many experiments in arguably infamous Skinner box. So that's operant conditioning. So yeah, well, uh, I'll introduce you to classical and operant conditioning right now. So uh, classical conditioning, uh, the classic example is that Pavlov put a dog uh, had a dog, right? And he managed to get the dog to salivate whenever there was a bell. Because when do dogs naturally naturally salivate? When there's food, right? But he would pair food with bells every single time. And then eventually, even when the dog didn't have food, he associated the salivation with um, the bell. So now when he sees the bell, the dog salivates. So we got terms like uh, the conditioned stimulus, the uh, unconditioned response, right? So conditioned, unconditioned stimulus response. We'll get to that in more detail in a later session. We also have operant conditioning, which is positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. So what this is, is for example, let's say uh, your child was very bad in a homework, right? Or they do really good in homework. So if they do well, you might give them candy. You're adding something that's good. That's positive reinforcement. Or you could take away something that they, they think is bad. For example, you could take away chores to reward them. If rather uh, they did poorly on the homework and you're a very strict parent, Positive punishment would be something like giving chores, or adding to their work. Negative punishment, you'd punish them by taking away something that they like. For example, take away all forms of stimulus, 
video games, YouTube, TikTok, right? And you put them in their room and you ground them. That's negative punishment. And we also have good old Sigmund Freud who pioneered psychoanalysis after he was unpleased or he wanted to experiment further and farther away from what was already quite interesting, which is hypnosis. Right? So psych psychoanalysis uh, was a tangent off of hypnosis and then it became much more prevalent for the first half of the 20th century. The concept is that unconscious forces that we're not even aware of is what dominates our behavior and controls us. Right? So uh, we we put their uh, half comedically, literally just Freud, because yes, he was uh, quite the, the passionate promoter of psychoanalysis. His theories uh, are as follows. They're very, uh, so this is a condensed version of what he believed in. So the unconscious mind is the cause of all our issues. Repressed traumatic memories manifest as present symptoms. Now, what does this mean? That's uh, basically, uh, it's a toned down version of we're not entirely aware of our wishes and fears. Hmm. So, our childhood shapes our adult personality. Uh, for example, many psychoanalysis therapists today, they will do uh, certain types of dream therapy, and what they do is they want to see if you have any memories that you had as a child that was traumatic. You've repressed them, but because you repressed them, you didn't know why you'd act in a certain way. For example, lash out at your boss, even though you really shouldn't or lash out at your boss. Well, maybe that was because you had a very, very demeaning parent, right? Uh, and you had a fear response to this, but you repressed it because it was a traumatic memory, so you don't know. And they'll be able to retrieve that through a dream, they'll, and they'll ask you, what did you dream of? And ultimately they'll say, hmm, so now we've uncovered this repressed memory, and that should be able to make you improve, according to the psychoanalysists. Uh, number three is that humans are inherently selfish and aggressive. Mind you, this is ju not just a psychoanalytic thing. It's also referenced a lot in literature, right? Uh, for example, there's a text called The Prince, where the essence of it is that politicians cannot be ideal because uh, it cannot be morally good all the time because if they were, they wouldn't be in power because humans are inherently selfish and aggressive and want to take away your power. And finally, the fourth one is transference and resistance. This are, these are just some buzzwords. These are keywords that are used to describe the interaction between uh, the therapist and the patient in psychoanalytic therapy. He also discussed development of sexuality, dream analysis, as, as I've mentioned before. And ultimately, what he's trying to find is psychological roots of abnormal behavior. We also have humanism. Hopefully this will be easier to remember because it's all it's the only one that's very, very positive. It has a very, very positive outlook on humans. The concept is that everyone is inherently good. They're motivated to learn and people will always want to improve. It refuted all the concepts that stated humans were inherently selfish and aggressive, like psychoanalysis. The important people were Carl Rogers, who pioneered the discussion of unconditional positive regard, which was a technique used in therapy, and Abraham Maslow, who developed the hierarchy of needs. For personal growth, uh, Rogers believed that individuals needed an environment of acceptance and support, not judgment. So even if you've committed multiple uh, atrocious crimes, if Rogers was your therapist, he'd, he'd just be like, I, I hear what you're saying. I understand you. I sympathize with you. How can I make you better? Right. So uh, this was a new approach to therapy, which is we focus on the client. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs 
on the other hand, it's a five-tier model of human needs from basic psychological, uh, physiological needs to self-actualization, which uh, is where one seeks to fulfill their potential. Yeah, you do need to memorize this. It will most likely be on the multiple choice questions of the HOSA exam. And finally, we're going to talk about the psychological perspectives. So we have cognitive psychology, which is the concept of how do humans learn, perceive, think, and remember? Right? How do humans solve problems and process information? We have people like Jean Piaget, who studied cognitive development in children, and Noah Chomsky, uh, who developed the idea that humans had an innate capacity for language acquisition. He was uh, fighting about this idea with the behaviorists who disagreed with him. So, oh yeah, this is where information processing or the metaphor of a computer really takes place. We receive information and then we process it and then we store it and we retrieve it like a computer. Uh, this is a, this is a few sequence that you also have to remember later on. Uh, they also study cognitive development, right? Sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, formal operational. That was uh, the main contribution of Jean Piaget. And they also pioneered cognitive behavioral therapy, which is still used today. And they combine cognitive and behavioral approaches to change maladaptive thought patterns uh, for the human to be able to uh, do more well for themselves. Additional perspectives include biological, which studied the connection between mind, behavioral, and uh, the biological perspective, uh, processes. We also have more detailed um, a pr a perspective on evolution, which is how does evolution in the past shape our present behavior? For example, the classic example, not uh, dreaming specifically, but even sleeping, right? Sleep patterns evolve so that uh, when we are cavemen, we, we would be able to relax and conserve energy when the predators wouldn't attack us, right? That's sleeping. And then when we did need to uh, uh, defend ourselves from predators, we would be awake. A social perspective is uh, stuff like, how is our behavior influenced by the presence of others? As social loafing, humans contribute us efforts and group commitments, right? Group projects, we tend to Think that oh, it's okay my group members will do it for us right or maybe you could have ex uh, experienced this as a victim of social loafing where you'd have to do all the work because everyone else would contribute less we also have developmental perspectives which is studying the normal changes in behavior and generalizing uh, the changes that occur in the human lifespan and finally we have clinical which explains and defines and treats psychological disorders, and it promotes general well-being, which is in use on mass today. So if you guys have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. That ends our discussion of the introduction to psychology for this lesson, and thank you for listening. See you next week.